All right, I'm not sure whether to call this a Dixie short or a marathon because it's a little longer than a short. Uh, but I'm going to pop off a couple of stories that I think are pretty good. And then the last part of the video is going to be chapter one of The Beast of Bray Road, The Accident, written by Tom Lyons and Travis Clark. It is one of the audiobooks that I, Tom and I have out on Audible. It's one of three in a series. You can go to my website, DixieCrypted.com, and find the, uh, just scroll down a little bit, and you'll see all the audiobooks I have out. And in uh, the next one or two videos, I'll put out the first chapter of uh, the White Mountain Bigfoot or the Broken Arrow Ranch. Just give you a little taste of what these audiobooks sound like. And if you're interested, just go to my website, click on the link, and it'll take you right to the Audible page where you can buy or use a credit to get those books. If you're interested, I just wanted to let you know what it looks like. But uh, let's get rolling with the video. Short, maybe not too short, but it should be fun. All right, here we go. Here's an email from Don. I think you'll enjoy this. He writes, I grew up on Pine Island in Southwest Florida. As a kid, I lived with my grandparents. Like most kids, I idolized my grandfather and followed him wherever he went. My grandparents always kept our dogs chained up outside at night. Late one night, when I was about seven or eight, the dogs started barking uncontrollably. This was unusual behavior for them, but not unheard of. My grandfather opened the front door and yelled at them to stop. Normally, they would listen to him, but that night, they just kept barking and barking. The next morning, as the sun came up, my grandfather went outside, just like any other day. I ran outside with him like I always did, following in his footsteps and mimicking every move. There was a large pine tree that stood at the corner of our property. Beyond that was an empty lot. There were no other homes around our house, just canals and swamps. My grandfather started walking out towards the tree, and I was following behind. As we approached, I looked up and saw what my grandfather was looking at. A limb was broken off. It was around 10 feet up and 6 to 8 inches round. In the sugar sand under the tree, there were extremely large footprints. They led down towards the canal, and I trailed behind my grandfather as he followed them to the water. The strides between the footprints were around three feet. I walked alongside them, trying to jump and match the step, but I was too small. We followed the steps to where they walked into the canal. My grandfather, who was Native American, looked at me and said, if you don't bother them, they won't bother you. I asked him who, but he never said a word. He just turned around and walked back up to the house. Many years later, I moved into a house in North Fort Myers with my kids. There were several acres of woods and swamp across the road. In January of 2016, I lost my father. That was not a good year. In July, I received a phone call that my sister had died unexpectedly. I fell to my knees and I cried. She and I had been very close. A short time later, I was sitting outside on my porch swing when I began to hear knocking late one night. I didn't think much about it. It would happen a few times a week. Then early one morning around 3 a.m., I saw the silhouette of a large person standing on the edge of the woods just outside of the light. Well, I ran inside and grabbed my gun and a spotlight but when I got back outside, no one was there. My kids used to walk our puppy down the dirt road in the evening. One night, they came back and told me they saw a monkey swinging from tree to tree. I just chalked it up to kids and their imaginations. Then I came across a video on YouTube of a baby Bigfoot swinging in the trees. I had my son look at the video and I asked him if this is what he saw. Yes, sir, he said. I began watching more videos. One of them had the wood banging on it and explained that this was a method of communication for them. Then I remembered what I saw with my grandfather when I was a kid. It was like someone turned on a switch. 
I sat down with both of my kids and I had a talk with them. I told the kids not to talk about them and not to bother them. Then I repeated what my grandfather had told me all those years ago. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you. After that, I sat almost every evening and listened to the wood knocking. I never felt like I was in danger or threatened in any way. Months later, I was dating a lady. It was late at night, and she was outside getting something out of her car. The next thing I knew, she was honking her horn. I came running outside, and she was crying hysterically. She told me something was in the woods, shaking the branches and growling at her. Later, I would learn that my girlfriend was not a nice lady. I eventually moved away from there, but I can't help but wondering if my neighbors in the woods were just watching out for me. (laughs) Don, Don, your Bigfoot friend saved you from an old hag of an old lady. I I know that sounds ugly, I said, but I just got a kick out of that. Bigfoot's like, no, you don't want to, you don't want to keep stay with that chick. But this was a good story, Don. I appreciate it. Southwest Florida, that's skunk egg territory. Thank you for sending it, man. It's really good. Here's a short little story from a man who doesn't want his name mentioned. Of course, always, that's no problem. Here's what he writes. This may be more of a Bigfoot hearing than a Bigfoot sighting. It happened on the Sulphur River in Lamar County in Texas sometime in the late 80s, maybe 1987 or 88. I was 39 years old and I was a police officer for one of the larger Texas cities, hence my need for anonymity. My wife and I were visiting the in-laws and were taking advantage of free babysitters so we could go out, lie in the back of my pickup truck and stargaze. We were in a cleared pasture that was open except for a few scattered pecan trees. It was a fairly unpopulated area bordered to the south by the Sulphur River. While we were lying there talking, we both heard what sounded like a guttural grunt, similar to a throat-clearing sound. Except this sound resonated enough that we felt it as much as we heard it. We both immediately raised up to see what had made the noise. I had my five-cell Kellite, Kel light, which was standard police gear at the time, so I shined it around and I couldn't see anything. I was armed and I suppose due to my police training and the fact that I was an ex-Marine and Vietnam veteran, I wasn't too alarmed. But my wife was ready to go. We packed up and left without seeing what had made the noise or hearing anything else. At the time, Bigfoot did not even enter our minds. We were thinking more in line with it being someone or a wild animal. Years passed and with increased interest in Bigfoot and the advent of YouTube shows, I started to add things up. Lamar County and Falk, Arkansas, of the legend of Boggy Creek fame, are a hundred miles apart, connected by the Sulphur River. There were ample old-growth pecan trees, large enough for anything to hide behind. I didn't wander too far from the truck, but I didn't see any animals run, and there were no cows in the pasture at the time. It's been 30-some years later, and my wife and I both believe that we were grunted at by a Bigfoot. We continued to go out to that land from time to time, but we never heard anything like that again. That area, like much of my beloved rural Texas, is becoming overpopulated, so stargazing isn't the same anymore. When we have stargazed, though, we've seen some interesting things over the years, but that's a different story for another time. To the writer, thanks for the email. This is great. That's an interesting story. But uh, stargazing, man, what a fun thing to do. Uh, I live in an area that's probably not the best area to get away from light pollution, but it's pretty good. But I have pine trees all around me, but I can lay in a lawn chair and just look up into the sky. And I love just laying there all by myself in the pitch black of the night, just looking up into the stars and Sometimes you see planets, you see Venus or Mars or Saturn. You know, recently we saw Saturn. I, I'm just rambling. I'm not really, I'm not really making any sense, but I love to do that. But the thing is, is uh, when it gets good and hot, then the mosquitoes start eating you up and the bugs are all over you. 
And if you can, you know, dope up with mosquito dope pretty good and, and just lay there still, it's a great thing to do. It's a great thing to take kids to do and just lay on a blanket in the middle of a field or your yard and look up and talk about what you see and just talk to the kids about the solar system and stars, learn a little bit about the stars and, and just blow their minds with some of the facts that we know about uh, the universe. It's really cool. Okay, I'll shut up. Enough of that said. Let's move on to something else. All right, here's chapter one of The Beast of Bray Road, The Accident. It is a number one in a series of three. Again, you can go to my website, dixiecrypted.com, scroll down just one or two bars, and you'll see a list of all the audiobooks that we have for sale. If you guys are interested in that, click on any of the links and it'll take you right to the Audible. But here is chapter one of The Beast of Bray Road, The Accident. Hope you like it. Chapter One When I opened my eyes, I quickly noticed how everything was so blurry. As far as I can remember, it was the first time that I had experienced impaired vision. As I sat upside down in the passenger seat, I patted my forehead, hoping that doing so would somehow force the throbbing headache to go away. The smell of gasoline and burnt rubber was so potent that it left little question about whether it contributed to my nausea. It took me a few moments to recollect why I was inside the vehicle in the first place. Oh, that's right. My dad and I were on our way to... wait, where was it again? I turned my attention to the driver's seat. More importantly, where was dad? And why were there streaks of dried blood that had slid down the backrest of where he once sat? As I unbuckled my seatbelt, my small and immature body plopped onto the roof of the vehicle. It's a good thing we were riding inside a Mitsubishi Montero, a car that had a higher roof. Otherwise, I might have never woken up due to my head getting squashed like a bug. When I stepped out of the vehicle, I couldn't remember where I was or even what state I was in. All I knew was that I was standing on a paved, gray-colored road that, as far as I could see, was in the middle of nowhere. Dad, I muttered as I stepped around the tipped-over dark green SUV. He was nowhere in sight. Dad, I shouted several times. There was no response other than the echo of my high-pitched ten-year-old voice. The more steps that I took, the more I realized how sore my neck was, forcing me to wonder how long I had been unconscious. The autumn air was brisk, motivating me to cloak my noggin with the hood of my sweatshirt. Enormous trees with leaves of various colors lined both sides of the street. A small section of gravel and tall grass was all that separated the pavement from the dense forest. Dad! I called out one more time. Again, there was no reply. I made my way back over to the vehicle to examine the driver's side. The door was hanging halfway open. It wasn't long before I noticed there were a series of odd-looking scrapes within the paint that surrounded it. Sure, it was apparent we had been in an accident, but even my adolescent brain possessed enough logic to suspect that these scrapes were created by something else. My heart rate increased as I began to get creeped out. I didn't need any more evidence to know that something was terribly wrong. At that moment, I would have done anything to have laid eyes on a house that I could run to. Yet, I didn't have the slightest idea of what I'd be running from. Without further hesitation, I booked it into the section of woods that was closest to the vehicle. As I crouched behind the most massive tree I could find, I wondered what time it was. It might have been due to my still fuzzy vision, but it seemed like it had already gotten darker since I woke up. How much time did I have before sundown? Suddenly, there was a rustling noise that came from somewhere a little deeper into the woods. A moment later, I noticed a bit of movement coming from a large shape within a not-too-distant tree. What is that? 
I squinted my eyes, desperate for them to regain focus and identify what seemed to be staring back at me. Relief washed over me when I heard a hoot and I realized that it was just a large owl. That feeling of comfort was short-lived when it suddenly flew off due to an even more mysterious noise. The only way I can think to describe it is that it was like a combination of a deep growl that trailed off into a more human-like cackle. Even at my young age, I tried to convince myself that the notion was ridiculous, but it was difficult to discard how the noise sounded somewhat evil. At that moment, I would have given anything for someone to get me out of there. A few seconds later, the noise occurred again. Not only did it sound closer, but there was a distant variation. This time, it had a ghostly echo to the growl that quickly transitioned into a low-pitched yap. Now trembling from fear, I continued to remain in place for maybe another 20 seconds before I heard another attention-grabbing noise. It was the sound of an approaching vehicle. Right away, I could tell the driver had begun to slow down after spotting the wreckage. I think that had to have been the most grateful I had ever felt at that early age. I then knew I was going to escape whatever it was lurking in these woods. On the other hand, if I were to leave, how would that improve my chances of locating my father? He couldn't have gotten that far away, right? What if he had gone looking for help, but his injuries had caused him to pass out before he could find someone? Hello, a man's voice called out from the road. Anyone out there? The sound of rock and roll music became louder as I weaved around the trees, making my way back toward the pavement. It was now dark enough that the shine from the headlights pierced the wood line. Yes, yes, I'm here, I shouted back. I'm coming. Are you by yourself? The voice replied, stumped as to why a child might be alone at the scene of a car accident. As I got close enough to the road, I spotted the silhouettes of two men. At least, I initially thought they were both men. Aside from my already impaired vision, the headlights shine made it challenging to make out much detail on either of the figures. I'm not sure what it could have been other than my instincts, but it was as if a voice warned me to refrain from getting any closer. Hey kid, you still there? The man shouted a split second before he was swept off his feet. The impact of his head hitting the pavement must have been so severe that he was barely able to get out a single peep. It all happened so fast, making it appear as though he had been sucked into the woods on the other side of the road. Thank you all for hanging with me on this video. I really appreciate you and we'll see you on the next one. See you next time. Thanks.